Welcome to the 700 Club. We're breaking his silence finally. President Biden has spoken. Did he take blame? Did the buck stop here? Oh, no. He doubled down on his decision to leave Afghanistan, and he played the blame game for the horrific fallout. So why was no one prepared for the rapid Taliban takeover? Both Republicans and Democrats are demanding answers. Meanwhile, the world is witnessing horrendous images of desperate Afghans trying to flee, some clean, clinging to the fuselage of a plane and then falling to their deaths. CBN's Jenna Browder has more from Washington. After a full day of dramatic images of Afghans trying to flee, President Biden addressed the nation Monday. And while he stuck to his decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan, he offered no explanation for why the U.S. wasn't prepared for the rapid collapse. Chaos and desperation at the Kabul airport. Thousands of Afghans crowding the runway surrounding this massive military jet, clinging to the outside of the fuselage, some of them falling to their deaths. Inside, 640 of the lucky. The Taliban announcing they're now in full control of Afghanistan. The outcry over those scenes forcing President Biden to come down from Camp David and talk to the American people. I stand squarely behind my decision. The president blaming the rapid fall of Afghanistan on the Afghan government and military. The truth is, this did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. So what's happened? Afghanistan political leaders gave up and fled the country. The Afghan military collapsed, sometime without trying to fight. And his predecessor. When I came into office, I inherited a deal that President Trump negotiated with the Taliban. On Capitol Hill, withdrawal, few lawmakers, withdrawal, Republican withdrawal. or Democrat, are defending Biden. What we have seen is an unmitigated disaster, a stain on the reputation of the United States of America. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell adding that the country could once again become a safe harbor for terrorists. Every terrorist around the world, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Africa, are cheering the defeat of the United States military by a terrorist organization. Even top Democrats are critical. Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Mark Warner issuing a statement calling for an investigation into the collapse. I hope to work with the other committees of jurisdiction to ask tough but necessary questions about why we weren't better prepared for a worst case scenario involving such a swift and total collapse of the Afghan government and security forces. There are also growing concerns over human rights, especially for women and girls. Biden says he'll continue to speak up for them, but many worry that won't be enough. In an effort to calm the population, the Taliban is offering amnesty and inviting women to be a part of their government. At the same time, there are reports of girls as young as 15 being forced to marry Taliban fighters. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. It's a horrible stain. And the buck does stop with the number one man. You know, former Secretary of Defense uh, Gates said, I've known him for many years, and Joe Biden has never made one right decision on foreign policy. Every time, everything he's enunciated has been wrong. And this is a disaster, and he's trying to put the blame on somebody else, and it makes you sick at your stomach. Well, senior international correspondent George Thomas has made several trips to Afghanistan since the U.S. invasion. He joins us now. George, the Taliban treatment of women has been horrific. What's this move about inviting them to join the government? Is that for real? Yeah, exactly. Is that for real? You, we, we both know that is not for real. This is window dressing, uh, uh, Pat. Uh, wait for the between 5,000 to 10,000 Americans to finally be evacuated from Afghanistan. Wait for the 6,000 troops that are uh, now controlling the Afghan, the Hamid Karzai International Airport, as, uh, as well as the other NATO troops. Trust me, once all of our forces are out, all of our Americans are out, then the real 
crackdown begins. This is window dressing. There is no way. This is a 7th century medieval group that believes that women are second-class citizens. There is no way that they're going to allow uh, women to participate in the, the governing process in Afghanistan. Today, Pat, uh, a few dozen Afghan women took to the streets of, uh, of Kabul, the capital city, uh, uh, demanding that they would have access to medical care. They would, they would have access to education. They'd be able to work in some of these places that were run, that were manned by, the, by, by women. Afghan tele, uh, 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 Taliban forces went in and told them to go home. The reality is that in the next uh, few weeks, months, we are going to see the severity of this group and what they believe in. And this is Islamic Sharia law. Let's not be, uh, let's not kid ourselves. 20 years later, this is a group that wants to take vengeance. And in fact, there are reports today that over the last 20 years, the United States, as well as our coalition forces, created a biometric database of all the Afghan uh, security forces that participated with coalition forces, as well as Afghan special forces, including NGOs, the non-governmental organizations that worked for the betterment of Afghanistan, including women, including Christians. The, Af the, the, uh, the, the reports are that the Taliban now has the entire biometric data list. In fact, there are reports as we come on the air today that from Herat to Mazari Sharif to Kandahar uh, to Kabul, uh, uh, Taliban are going door to door checking with them. Had, they have in their hands the biometric information, looking for people, uh, those who worked with the Afghan government and those who worked uh, with the United States uh, these past 20 years. This is no joke. Uh, George, one, one last question. Uh, Biden has done something, it seems to me, rather foolish. He's putting more troops into the embassy. I mean, how are they ever going to get out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the, 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 the State Department yesterday said that they were preparing for all kinds of scenarios, but clearly you can see we only had about 2,500 troops uh, prior to a few weeks ago. Suddenly we have this influx. If you are all concerned about getting troops out, why would you have this massive, uh, you know, influx of troops? This is going to be the challenge. And to, to tell you, Al-Qaeda today from from the streets of Sweden to Yemen to Saudi Arabia uh, to Iraq to the to, to the deserts uh, sands of Morocco all the way to Pakistan, Al Qaeda and all of the various alphabet soups of uh, terrorist organizations are praising what has happened. In fact, a, a major group that monitors uh, traffic uh, and chatter amongst the uh, insurgent groups, the Al Qaeda groups, uh, said jihadists have portrayed the Taliban conquest of Afghanistan as a watershed event akin to the 9-11 events. Thanks, George. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, the commander-in-chief is incompetent, and his military uh, advisors may not be too competent either. But he did go against the advice of his senior leaders who warned him that this was not the right course. He went ahead and did it anyhow. And we have at the head of our government somebody who is just not with it. And boy, if there was ever a time to ask for God's mercy on America, that's it. But we are, unfortunately, you have to live under the actions of your leaders. And if it's wrong, then you have problems. And we have another problem that Biden and Kamala, Kamala Harris have refused to acknowledge, and that is 50. 1,500 migrants, all of them have COVID positive, have flooded into McAllen, Texas in just one week. And that's the tip of the iceberg. Hundreds of thousands of illegals are landing in American communities day after day, the highest number in 21 years. So when will the president do his job and secure our border? And until then, how much more at risk is the health of Americans? Here's our reporter, Tara Mergener, with that story. In July alone, a record 210,000 migrants entered the U.S. along the border, often with the help of smugglers. Many of those putting their feet on American soil for the first time are said to be carrying COVID. Detention facilities out of space, agents overwhelmed, and border communities like McAllen, Texas, in a state of emergency. It's an issue, and I keep on saying we shouldn't have to be dealing with. As thousands of migrants per week, none vaccinated, make their first pit stop here. In one week alone, 
Joe Biden and Kamala Harris released 1,500 illegal immigrants into McAllen who were COVID positive. Across the entire southwest border, illegal crossings are at a 21-year high. Judging from the number of people I'm seeing down here on Mexico's southern border in the city of Tapachula, those numbers could be about to get very much worse. Swarms of people, including 19,000-plus unaccompanied children, turning themselves into agents in July. Our drone video showing a massive group of illegal immigrants being held by Border Patrol under Anzal Duas Bridge. It's the largest group we have ever seen. Critics are sounding the alarm across the country, blaming Biden's border policies. They will defend the illegal immigrants against the right of Americans. Day after day, hundreds of thousands of migrants landing in communities across the nation via planes, trains and automobiles. Why don't you get this border secure? And until you do that, I don't want to hear a blip about COVID from you. But those blips aren't going away given the Delta variant. People are dying and will die who don't have to die. And if anything, the Biden administration and the CDC are focusing on unvaccinated and unmasked Americans. Something supersedes that need to do exactly what you want to do. While almost ignoring the border crisis. Actions like that causing some on the left to call for the president to impose order on the increasingly out of control migration. The Washington Post editorial board is as liberal as they come, probably the most liberal paper in the nation competing with the New York Times. They know that this is a politically toxic issue. And agencies on the border report as many as one in five migrants are showing up in the U.S. with COVID. The administration is reportedly preparing to help control it by offering them vaccines paid for by U.S. taxpayers. Pat. Uh, Tara, what's behind this policy of sending thousands of these migrants to communities across the U.S.? Well, Pat, that's the billion-dollar question. You know, Republicans, of course, insist President Biden is doing this for politics' sake. But the reality is, once they're here, they've got to go somewhere. They are coming into the country, as you know, in enormous numbers. Officials say we are on track now for a record 2 million crossings this year. Border Patrol cannot keep them. They are not in custody. And once they're processed, they can go anywhere they want in the U.S., often unannounced. And these communities are getting stuck with the tab for whatever services they use there. And by the way, most of them do not have to appear in court anymore. So likely, COVID or not, they're going to remain here illegally and fade into the shadows. And now there is even more concern about terrorists coming through with the toppling of Afghanistan. Border Patrol has seen people coming in now from at least 70 countries so far, including places like Pakistan and China. Pat, there's talk terrorists will try to take even more advantage now with what's going on in Afghanistan coming through our border. Tara, we appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, doesn't it make you just ask God, what have you done? We didn't vote in a bunch of incompetence. Was the election stolen? It may well have been. But how do we get somebody who is totally incompetent and who is slightly uh, in his dotage to run this country? And this thing at the border, they're ignoring it. And Kamala Harris was given that responsibility, and she failed it miserably. We are, well, I don't know what's happening, but if there was ever a time to pray for America, we sure are looking at it now. It's called the long goodbye. Alzheimer's disease robs victims of their memories, their relationships, even their sense of who they are. It slowly steals their life away long before their heart stops beating. But what if there was a way to reverse the symptoms of Alzheimer's? Well, it turns out there is. Here's our medical reporter, Lori Johnson, with some very good news. A number of Alzheimer's patients are describing how they regained their memory after starting the Bredesen protocol. It's not a drug. Instead, it's a number of lifestyle changes, including diet, exercise, and much more, each designed to address the approximately 40 different causes of Alzheimer's. As you can imagine, I was terrified. Nine years ago, after Julie Gregory got lost on a very familiar road, she soon learned she had Alzheimer's. 
I have lived in this town in um, the foothills of Georgia for 20 years. And I would run into people in shops who knew me very well. And Lori, I had no idea who they were. Um, my personality began to change. Julie also learned no cure or viable treatment exists for the disease. I even contemplated ending my own life. And I think prayer brought me to the point where I realized what I was learning from mainstream medicine just wasn't true. I began to believe in this voice that was telling me there was something I could do. She tried the Bredesen protocol, got back to normal, and has stayed there ever since. What he does is identify and address every person's contributor to their symptoms. It's just plain old common sense, and my experience shows me that it works. Sally Weinrich tells a similar story. I forgot to pick up my grandchildren twice, one morning in the morning for school, within a month period of time. Five years ago, Sally also considered suicide after experiencing the unmistakable signs of Alzheimer's. I had two relatives die from it, really three relatives die from it, on both sides of my family. I knew I was at risk for it. I had a dread for it. She believes God led her to Dr. Dale Bredesen. I had all of the Dr. Bredesen's causes of Alzheimer's, and I think in my case, my Alzheimer's would have progressed very rapidly. Instead, the opposite happened. The best thing about my Alzheimer's today is I have answers for it and I have reversed it. It's wonderful. I love life. I enjoy life. Sally, Julie, and five others describe their amazing reversals in the first survivors of Alzheimer's, how patients recovered life and hope in their own words. They gave their their specific protocols because they are personalized. Here's what each person did, how they did it, what their workarounds were, etc. Over 2,000 people are currently on the plan. Clinical trial results released in 2020 showed 84 percent of plan participants with mild cognitive impairment experienced improved cognition. 12 percent continued to decline and 4 percent showed no change. In the people in our trial that we recently published, um, we actually saw increase instead of decrease in their gray matter in their brain. So you can actually see that there's improvement not only in their test scores, but also in their MRIs. The first step of the protocol is the so-called cognoscopy to determine a person's individual risk of cognitive decline. This involves a computer quiz to assess your mental capability, as well as a number of blood tests to identify which areas a person needs to make changes. And often there are 10 or more, and then we target those with a precision medicine sort of approach. For most, that involves a low-carbohydrate diet, intermittent fasting, plenty of exercise, sleep, eliminating toxic exposures, as well as hormone and nutrient balancing. Identifying those things and addressing them is how we see these people surviving so well. It's a lot of effort and some expense, but people like Sally and Julie say it's better than the alternative. Right, you know, they used to talk about amyloid plaques. There was some kind of a germ or bacteria that caused this. Uh, the the uh, Bredesen protocol just debunks that, doesn't it? Sort of. They say that the amyloid plaques that develop in your brain that are associated with Alzheimer's, the, the, those are not the cause of Alzheimer's. Those plaques are actually a protection mechanism to protect our brain for the actual things that are attacking the brain. So if the idea is to get rid of the amyloid plaques, that's not going to solve the problem. The, you have to get rid of the things that are attacking your brain. And so uh, that's kind of those two uh, areas of thought. And the medical community right now, Pat, is sort of divided about the issue of amyloid plaques. Of course, everybody knows that they're associated with Alzheimer's. Some say they're the cause, so we got to get rid of them. Other people, like Dr. Dale Bredesen, say they're a result of the insults of all these other things on the brain and uh, that they're not the cause, that you really need to go to, go to that source. 
Well, the FDA hadn't approved the Bradison protocol, has it? But they're talking about they, they may have uh, one drug they're approving. That's right. So the Bredesen protocol is not approved by the FDA because, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's not a drug. It's not a pharmaceutical product. It's not a combination of drugs or pharmaceutical products. So, but that's not to say that a lot of doctors aren't behind it. There are 2,000 doctors, medical doctors, who have trained in the Bredesen protocol. I actually go to one right here in this area. A year ago, I went to her. She's a medical doctor. I had my cognoscopy. I I've been on the Bredesen protocol for an entire year, and there are lots of other doctors around the country who can help people with it. And to find out more information, go to our website, cbnnews.com. You can hear my personal story. You can watch the entire interview that I just did with Dr. Bredesen and find out all about this Bredesen protocol, which is a little bit complicated. But so, yes, you talked about the other Alzheimer's, Adjuhelm, which was approved two months ago. This drug is, uh, this, this approval, by the FDA of Adjuhelm is being investigated by a congressional committee right now. And also, uh, the FDA is doing an internal investigation about the approval process. The medical doctors uh, who were advising the FDA, not one single one of them, advise the FDA to approve this after the FDA approved it anyway. Three of them quit. I know one of them, actually. Uh, he is the person who is uh, the chancellor at the medical school where my, husband, my, my uh, son graduated. Another one of these doctors who quit the committee said in his resignation letter that, that approving that drug was the worst decision the FDA has ever made. So that drug is very controversial, Pat. Uh, right, just uh, in a capsule. Well, it's the same sort of thing we deal with. It's, it's, it's the inflammation problem, isn't it? The, 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 our body has got inflammation, uh, and that's the results of eating all this mess, messy food we eat. Am I right? Absolutely, you're correct. And so Sally Weinrich, one of those women who, by the way, she and her husband love the Lord Jesus so much. And uh, she said that this Alzheimer's program that she's on is also a great way to prevent cancer and heart disease, because you're right, it's largely about inflammation of the brain. But it's a little bit more complicated than just eating right and exercise. There are some other things. For example, uh, Sally had a, an issue with mold, a toxic mold, and so she needed to get rid of that exposure because it was affecting her brain. The other woman had a tick-borne disease uh, that was the, the bacteria from that was still in her body and attacking her brain. But the good news is they addressed these things and got rid of them. Well, Lori, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a silent death. It is the most awful, awful thing. I've known some people who have had Alzheimer's, and it just breaks your heart to see their slowly but surely losing consciousness of who they are. And it's a silent death. We don't want to have it with anyone. This book is called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Dale Bradison, MD, I recommend you get it. You can get it wherever books are sold. It's too important to ignore. Terry? Zach Miller was going down fast due to COVID-19. Doctors said he had only one option. It was the thing Zach feared the most, being put on a ventilator. So why did he finally agree to it? What happened next? And how did a massive call on social media help save him? Take a look. <coughs> I couldn't breathe. My chest was getting heavy and I was coughing. It had been two weeks since pastors Zach Miller, his wife Mandy, and their kids had become ill in December of 2020. While they were on the mend, Zach continued to get worse. I was concerned. I had, you know, heard all of the stories. It did worry me. Meanwhile, Mandy looked to her sister, Holly, a radiologist, for guidance. Finally, he was struggling to breathe. His heart rate would, uh, was over 200 beats per minute. I told Mandy that it was definitely time for Zach to go to the hospital. By then, Zach was so ill, Mandy had to call for an ambulance. We were all gathered, and I remember just telling them, you have to pray. We need a miracle. I need you to pray. Zach was taken to Mercy Hospital in Rogers, Arkansas. Unable to stay with Zach in the hospital, Mandy waited in the parking lot. Finally, an ER doctor called. 
Zach was COVID positive and had critically low oxygen levels. The infection had gone septic and he was fighting double pneumonia. He assured me, he said, this is going to be a very short stay. Zach is young and healthy, no pre-existing conditions. However, over those next few days, Zach went into respiratory failure. By December 30th, doctors felt there was only one option. He was unable to oxygenate his blood. The ventilator at that point was his option for survival. That was the last thing the Millers wanted. I had heard people who were put on ventilators would never come off. The nurse came in and she simply said, you know what, this is where we're going. We really need you to get on a ventilator. I could see the urgency in her eyes. Finally, the couple agreed to have Zach intubated. At once, Mandy prayed, trying to quiet the thoughts racing through her mind. We've got to grow old together. Um, I can't do this life without him. Um, By now, there was no time to waste, and the staff scheduled the procedure immediately. Before they wheeled Zach into ICU around 2 a.m., Mandy asked to FaceTime with her husband. I remember Mandy waving at me and saying, babe, it's going to be OK. You got this. And he gave me a thumbs up. It was then Mandy put another option in motion. She reached out on social media asking family, friends, and the members of their congregation to wake people up and pray. We had a Zoom call set up. We just had people praying together. We had our staff and leadership praying, just singing and worshiping. My prognosis was very guarded. However, I knew that hope and prayer and faith were the only things that were going to get us through this. In the darkest point of my life, I could feel such hope and such peace um, through those prayers. For the next nine days, the prayers continued, and Zach remained critical but stable. Then on January 8th, doctors started weaning him off the ventilator, hoping his lungs were strong enough to breathe on their own. Two days later, on Sunday, January 10th, Mandy was leading an online church service when she got a video chat call. It was his nurse. Michael, and he said, hey, I was just calling to give you an update on Zach. And then he turns the phone around and puts it on Zach. And it took me probably a good five seconds or so before it dawned on me, oh my goodness, the, the tube is out. The next day, Zach was moved out of the ICU to a step-down room. I could just feel the presence of God. I looked over at the oxygen monitor, they keep a pulse ox on your finger. At the time, it was at 90. And right after I sat up, it went all the way up. And my oxygen levels were as high as they had ever been. Seven days later, Zach was discharged. And while it would take eight more weeks of rest, he fully recovered. The fact that he didn't have long-term complications is a testimony to the healing that God did in Zach through this process. Today, Zach and Mandy look forward to healthy, happy lives grounded by a faith rooted in prayer. Prayer became my lifeline. It became everything. Over and over in my life, I've learned one thing, that God is faithful. God is so faithful and he, you know, not only does he never leave us or forsake us, but he puts us in his family so that in times of distress like this, we can call on each other to stand and to pray because prayer makes a difference. And that's why we want to pray for you right now. And before we actually do that, we have other answers to prayer that have come in. Pat, this is Angela who lives in San Bernardino, California. She called the CBN prayer line regularly. One time, we prayed with her for a woman named Jessica and her mother. Jessica's lungs weren't working due to pneumonia, and her elderly mom contracted COVID-19. Both were in ICU at mm. the same time. Angela also included her nephew in her prayer request. He got the virus while he was incarcerated. She's calling to say all three have made a miraculous and Praise complete God. Recovery. Here's one artist who lives in Shreveport, Louisiana, had a diagnosis of colon cancer. He called our prayer line. And the prayer counselor prayed with him, and her doctor followed up with great news, no more cancer. Praise so God. listen, we've got people on the phones who know how to pray, and they hold on to God for you. And we're just so thrilled that it's available 24 hours a day. People are praying constantly. So we want to pray for you right now on this program. It's time. And whatever your needs are, 
It could be COVID. It could be cancer. It could be a whole lot of other things. But God Almighty is the, is the healer. By His stripes, you already are healed. We're going to join hands. Father, we thank you for what you're doing for people. We thank you that you're reaching down among your people and you're answering their prayers. And we call upon you now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We ask for healing. There's somebody in this audience, I believe the name is Matilla, and, and you've got what's called a widow's hump. Your, your uh, spine has begun to deteriorate. Right now, in the name of Jesus, the power of God is going through you, and your back is going to be straightened, and the bones will be strong, and you will be healed in the name of Jesus. Terry. There's someone else. You have an audio problem. You're, it's it's um, not ringing. It's almost like voices sound Thank like you. they're in a tunnel. God is restoring your hearing to you completely. All of that now is being healed in Jesus' name. Uh, somebody's vocal cords. You, you're a singer, and and your vocal cords have, have have had some damage. I don't know exactly what it is. It may have been kind of radiation or something, but something has burned your vocal cords. Jesus, put your hand on your throat right now. God is healing you. Touch him. Now, Father, we're praying again for those people in Afghanistan. We think of the women over there who are suffering. We think of the people who are being killed by this Taliban. We think for our brave men and women who are still on duty over there in the embassy. And we pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray for our nation. Lord, give us godly leaders. Give us wise leaders. Give us men and women of integrity to lead this land. And we pray in the name of Jesus for this great country we live in. And may it still be the hope of the world. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen, amen. and amen. Give us a call. Remember I told you we've got folks at the phones. And they believe God. We, that we've had thousands, and I we use that term advisedly, thousands of answers to prayer. And these people have been wonderful. They've led people to the Lord. They know Jesus, and they're there for you. But we'd love to hear those testimonies. 1-800-700-7000. Terry. Time now for your questions and Pat's honest answers. Well, Pat, the first question comes from Carisha, who says, I recently attended a modeling and confidence class where we had to do some exercises. They ended up being yoga poses. I did them, which I deeply regret. I have prayed, asked God for forgiveness, and renounced all the associated spirits, etc. Will God forgive me? I also noticed other exercises, such as the plank, are also like yoga. So which exercises can we do without compromising our faith? Um. Look, the thing that they have about yoga that was so bad, you had to pronounce some kind of a mantra, and it was in Hindu, and people didn't realize that they were praying to Hindu gods. As far as exercises, some of those stretching exercises that they call yoga is very healthy. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't get all worked up about it, but what I think is just don't get into the stuff where you're saying this mantra and you don't know what the, what the words are. The next thing you know, you're praying to some Hindu deity. But as far as stretching and certain types of exercises, I mean, you know, if they're good, they're good. Don't worry about it. This is Gail who says, my question is, how can I be sure of voting integrity next year when I cast my vote? How can I be sure the radical left won't taint the voting process again? I fear that everything is so corrupt and that we'll never have an honest election again. I live in Florida and trust my own state, but I don't trust the Democratic run states. Well, uh, I think there were some irregularities in the last election. I think they're trying to clean it up. And some of those voting machines, uh, I know there have been a lot of suits that uh, uh, you know, the voting machine companies, but I, I, I think they were fa faulty and flawed and they need to be corrected. But the big thing is, is H.R. 1, the idea that you'll send out ballots across the country to almost anybody and they cannot have verification. You need to be sure. And what was proposed, for example, uh, in, in Georgia uh, was very sound. I mean, the idea is you, and you need to verify who it was that's voting. And uh, Biden got on the air and started talking about Jim Crow on steroids. He was just lying. You know, they do a lot of lying. But that kind of a law is very important. 
you need to know who's voting. And the idea of getting ballots sent in the mail indiscriminately, that opens the door for fraud. And the H.R. 1 that was proposed by the Democrats would have done just that. It would federalize elections and it was horrible. But so far, it hadn't, it hadn't come to a vote and just work it to keep that from doing it, okay? This is Teresa who says, who are the two witnesses seen by John during the second woe in Revelation 11, 3 through 14? Are they Elijah and Moses? Well, I'm, I don't know for sure because, you know, there's a lot of Revelation that's got a hidden no, they say it's, it's revelation, but it's anything but revealing. But the idea is uh, Moses stands for the law and Elijah for the prophets, and the law and the prophets are the, uh, the substance of the, of the revelation of God. So I think that's what we're talking about. All right. yeah, Kevin says, Pat, I'm not understanding the prodigal son scripture in light of what Hebrews 6, 4 through 5 says. Quote, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Could you help me understand? I was a backslider, but now I'm living my life for Jesus. Uh, look, the thing is, whether you apostate, whether you have turned and counted the blood of Christ an unholy thing, that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. It's impossible if you... If you turn so much away that you count the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus an unclean thing, uh, you haven't done that, so don't, don't worry about it. You know, to the prodigal son is, is, is the, the nature of God. He opens his heart to somebody who's living immorally and wasting money, and the Lord takes him back into the home, all right? Okay, this is Madison who says, hello, I'm 16, and recently someone who was so, so, so important to me decided to leave my life. I love him too much to let him go. He was my best friend for years, and I have never felt a pain like this. I need God's help to repair our relationship because I can't do it alone. How should I pray? Well, you just do that, and you tell the Lord, tell him what's on your heart. You know, they call it puppy love. There's a laugh about it, but... I tell you, those early love affairs are very, very important in people's lives, mm -hmm. and those relationships are very important, but you do grow out of them, and what uh, you've got to believe is that God will listen to you, but you come to God and say, Lord, I've got this thing in my heart. Please fill me with your spirit, and God will take away the pain. He understands what's going on. And uh, nobody should laugh at you and because we know it's very important. But God knows it too. And if you come to him and say, Lord, I've got this problem, help me. And the Lord will answer your prayer and he will do a miracle in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your questions. We appreciate that. I hope we got some answers. Yes, we did. And more tomorrow. More tomorrow. Yeah, okay. Well, pregnant with no idea where her next meal was coming from. That's what happened to a young mother in Mexico. Both she and her husband lost their jobs because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So where did they turn for help? Take a look. When COVID-19 hit the nation of Mexico, more than a million people who were working at the time lost their jobs. People like Blanca and her husband, who was out looking for work the day we met. I used to work as a housekeeper, but due to the pandemic, I lost my job. Blanca is also pregnant and taking care of her sister and her new baby. I can't go out and just look for a job. It's too big a risk because of the baby. It's so frustrating. We really need the money to buy food. When Operation Blessing learned about the need in the community, we sponsored a food program through a local church that prepared and delivered more than 200 meals a day for an entire month. Now, thanks to the meals, I don't have to worry about what my son and my sister-in-law will be eating. We also gave families a gallon of chlorine bleach manufactured by Operation Blessing Mexico to disinfect and keep their homes safe from COVID. I don't know how to thank you. I'm eternally grateful, and I hope God will repay you. I'm eternally grateful, and I hope God will. It is such a joy. You know, the Bible says, and he's absolutely, it's more blessed to give than to receive. 
And for us to be able to give somebody a hope and life and food, you know, we have so much in this country, and it's such a blessing to be able to carry. You know, I, I have a hard time enjoying all the good things I've got without being able to share them with somebody else. So I, I think that this is what we do with Operation Blessing and CBN. So again, how can you be part of it? It's real simple. It's a $20 a month gift. It's called Operation, I mean, excuse me, the 700 Club. We have various club levels. But we want to have you as part of an army of thousands. And when you do, I, I want to send you something as to show you we are appreciated. I was able to read some selected scriptures from the book of Romans. And we've got some lovely music along with it, and it seems to touch people's hearts. Well, it does. It sure touched Yolanda. She lives in Astoria, New York, and she said, Brother Pat, God is for us was a wonderful, mm. easy to understand message. It really lets you know where to stand with our Lord. I love the entire audio. Thank you. And people are all saying that, Pat, well, that have heard this. What right, a well, great encouragement. It's there for you, but call right now so you can count on me. 1-800-707-1000, a month we want you as 700 club members. Terry? Poker and the TV show Survivor both were obsessions for Anna Kate. So when Anna became a contestant on Survivor Cambodia, she was in her element as a fierce competitor. Then she got booted off the island mid-season and Anna crashed and burned. Anna Kate has always been drawn to games of strategy. She competed on Survivor season 32 Ko Rong, and before that, she was a professional poker player. I love Survivor and poker because they're very similar. They're both very similar to life. There are um, different situations you have to adjust to. There's reading people, um, analyzing situations. Survivor and, and poker really be became my two obsessions, my two idols. The daughter of a Jewish father and Russian mother, Anna attended church growing up, but says religion got in the way of a real relationship with God. There's all these rules, there's all these things you have to do. I didn't like it. I felt very constricted. I really pushed away from God. I really thought God isn't real. And that actually led me into the um, belief that, you know, there is no God. Then her parents divorced. It was around that time that Anna began to define herself as an atheist. I definitely felt abandoned. I felt rejected. Even though my father um, was a good dad in the, in the sense that he didn't, you know, leave my life forever. He, I still spent every weekend with him. There was a lot of pain there. I was looking for, for satisfaction in the man. I was looking for love and I was never fulfilled. As a teen, she fell in love with the game of poker. Someone had a game and they asked me to sit down and play. When I like something, I, I go all in. I get really passionate and really driven. It's a st strategy game. There's more to poker than meets the eye. I thought it was super fascinating. It kind of became an addiction. After graduating high school, she went on to earn a degree in biology. Instead of attending medical school, she moved in with her boyfriend, a pro poker player who helped hone her skills in the game. We would play all day. We would go to dinner, come home, play nightly tournaments. You know, relatively speaking, you know, was I super, super successful? No, I didn't play the major big tournaments. I sustained myself. You know, some tournaments, sometimes I'd win $10,000 a day and sometimes $3,000, $4,000. I had fun doing it. Inside, Anna wasn't as happy as she seemed. My life was spontaneous, but it wasn't fruitful. I was so broken inside. Anna says she was hopeful when she heard about an opportunity to audition for her favorite show, Survivor. I didn't have the best audition tape. And I asked them, how, why did you call me? I really messed up the interview. And they said, no, Anna, we saw something in you. Anna was voted off mid-season and returned home devastated. She says her life began to unravel. As Anna questioned the meaning of life, her relationship with her boyfriend was falling apart. I went into a really deep, dark space where I didn't know what to do with my life because here I am not wanting to play poker, which I wanted to do every single day. And here I am with my ex who's looking at me like, why aren't you playing? Broken and desperate, she cried out to God. I knew I was in a relationship that I had to get out of. And I remember I got on my knees. I mean, bawling, weeping, broken. I remember I said, God, if you are real, 
show me your real. What do I do with my life? Because I'm lost and I don't know what to do. Two weeks passed and Anna didn't have the answer she was looking for. She was invited on a school tour with other reality TV stars, sharing positive messages to young students. After the program, one of the celebrity speakers told her he had a message from God. You felt the Holy Spirit before and God is real, just so you know. And I said, what? And so I thought about it. At once, she knew what he was talking about. She told him the story of when she was a teenager on a trip to Jerusalem with a student group. She and a friend had gone to the Western Wall. Here I was with my friend blaspheming God. We were, I was saying, what came out of my mouth was, look at these idiots praying to a God that doesn't exist. I heard this beautiful singing start, thousands of voices singing, ah, and it was everywhere. I mean, I looked around and I couldn't understand where the singing was coming from. It was the most incredible, profound experience in my life, and I never knew what it was, but uh, you know, it was just, I wasn't ready to hear. I told him the story, and I remember at the end of the story, he goes, you felt the Holy Spirit, Anna, and you heard angels singing. I knew I heard angels singing, and that was when I knew that God was real and he was trying to, trying to get my attention. And I remember I fell on my knees, I, I, I repented, I said, Jesus, forgive me, and I gave my life to the Lord. And I remember all of the burdens, all of the depression, sadness, brokenness, I remember feeling it, the weights of it lift off my shoulders. Anna began to experience a real relationship with God through Bible study and prayer. Eventually, she left the relationship she was in and gave up pro poker. God has always been there for me. Jesus has always been there for me. He's just the most amazing thing in the universe, and I just wish more people knew about him, knew him intimately, because knowing him intimately is where all the keys are to his heart. It's so fulfilling, and you know, being lost and broken, searching for love, I found it in Jesus. He's a gentleman, and he'll knock on your door until you answer and open that door, and he's just, he's incredible. You know, all of us have things in our mind, in our hearts that we think would make us happy, would make us be fulfilled. And for a long time, we push off the concept of God, either because we've been turned off by religion, as Anna had been, or because we want to do it our way. You know, we have a tremendous need inside of us to control, don't we? And that's something that has to be surrendered. Anna, in her need to control her environment and to find some meaning in her life, you know, tried all of these things that involved strategies that she thought she was so clever and so smart and so deep and learning these things and able to control her life. You know, she's right. God does come after us. He comes after us time and time again. And I had it happen in my life. I, I just didn't listen. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to let go. But one by one, God begins to allow the things in our lives that we depend on to be pulled away until we finally come to a place where we fall on our knees and say, God, I don't just need you. I want you. Maybe you're at that place in your life where you've come to the end of your rope and you want to know why you're here, who you are, who he is. What is this life all about? Listen, ask him into your heart. Just what Anna talked about. Just give it all up to him. You too will feel that burden lift up off your shoulders of just trying to manage and control it all. But more than that, you'll find the forgiveness and the love and the freedom that a God who has always been waiting for you can bring into your life. If you need to pray with someone about something specific in your life today, our line is always open and there's a friend there who'd love to pray with you today. It's toll free, 1-800-700-7000. So please call. You don't have to, have to give your name. They'd be happy to pray with you today. Pat? I think a lot of people will respond to that. That was a beautiful uh, message. Well, today's power minutes for the book of 1 John. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Well, tomorrow, the face-off, the governor's race that could be a game-changer in 2020. 
Meet the GOP candidate, Glenn Youngkin, on tomorrow's 700 Club. So we look forward to seeing you then. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And remember, our phones are available if you need prayer all day long. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.